Hey y'all, Coach in the fight here. Looking at Command 10 out of the Shepherd of Hermes. We are just about finished with these uh, 12 chapters out of the Shepherd of Hermes, the second book called Commands. We're looking at Command 10, which says, Of the sadness of the heart, and that we must take heed not to grieve the Spirit of God that is in us. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next 20 verses or so, is how sadness affects the elect. How grief affect the chosen this is um, very detrimental to the elect of God the chosen of God or anybody who wants to have faith in the father sadness and grief has a negative effect and we're going to find that out he's going to talk about sadness he's going to talk about grief and he's going to talk about doubting and what those effects are on us all right so sit back for a minute and enjoy the show go ahead and hit the like button go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and give your comments as we go all right so let's start verse one he says put all sadness far from thee for it is the sister of doubting and of anger how sir said i is it the sister of these for sadness and anger and doubting seem to me to be very different from one another all right now, this is the Shepherd of Hermas. Just for you guys who stumble in on this class, maybe this is the first time you've heard anything from the Shepherd of Hermas. But what's going on here is you have an angel, the angel of repentance, who is teaching Hermas virtues. He's um, explaining things to Hermas so that Hermas can come back and write this book that we all can learn these virtues. All right. That's who's talking. They're going to have a back and forth conversation where we're going to learn about these these things, sadness, anger and doubting. All right. Look at verse two. And he answered, art thou without sense that thou dost not understand it? For sadness is the most mischievous of all spirits and the worst to the servants of God. It destroys the spirits of all men and torments the Holy Spirit and it saves talking about sadness sadness seems to be something very powerful right seems to be very negative seems to be very harmful look what it says sadness is the most mischievous of all the spirits right and notice that he does say that it is that it is a spirit right then this should put you in mind of those uh powers that we have to fight the new testament tells you that we fight against not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Well, these are the powers that he's talking about. There's at least one of them is the power of sadness. And we're seeing how it affects. He says, and the worst of the servant of God. So sadness is the worst to the servant of God. Yeah, he's going to explain why it is. You know, out of all the bad things going on in the world, sadness is the one that breaks through to the children of God more often than not. You know? It destroys the spirit of all men, not just the elect, but it affects all men and even the Holy Spirit. Talking about sadness. All right, let's look at verse 3. Sir, said I, I am very foolish and understand not these things. I cannot apprehend how it can torment and yet save. Here said he and understand. They who never sought out the truth, nor inquire concerning the majesty of God, but only believe are involved in the affairs of the heathen all right now he's calling out some of you guys he's calling out some of us specifically the ones who believe in the father but never go in and actually try to um, uh, um, read his word and understand what he expects of us we believe in Jesus but we never pick up the gospel to find out who Jesus is is what he's talking about Verse 4 says, and there is another lion prophet that destroys the minds of the servants of God. That is of those that are doubtful, not of those that fully trust in the Lord. Now those doubtful persons come to him as to a divine spirit and inquire of him what shall befall them. All right. So now we talked about there up there in verse 3, these doubtful spirits and how they are created. So a person who, if you put these two together, a person who um, only believes in the Father without any uh, biblical knowledge to know what exactly it is that they believe in 
are going to be doubtful individuals. They have no foundation. They don't really know what they believe in. Of course, they're going to be doubtful. You remember, we are all worldly people here in 2019. We've been taught by our schools. We've been taught by our churches. We've been taught by our hospitals and our courthouses. And all of these institutions have taught us worldly stuff. They've gotten us into a mindly world set, a, a, a worldly mindset. Which is opposite to our father's mindset. Believe it or not, if you never read read the Bible before, let, let me uh, give a bit of a spoiler alert. It is actually almost opposite to everything we have ever learned. And so when you start to notice things that that are contrary or contradictory to what you've already been t always been taught, it's going to cast doubt on whether or not what you're reading or what you're hearing about in the scripture is actually true or not. I mean, it sounds so different than what you've always been taught. But let me tell you again, it is opposite. All right. But here in verse four, he's talking about the lion prophet, the lion prophet. Now, understand what a prophet is. Um, now, you have two types of prophet. Of course, today you have a prophet down there at the church, which is anybody who either convinced themselves or were convinced to buy somebody else that they should take on the name of a prophet right but the biblical sense of a prophet is somebody who has had a face-to-face -face conversation with the father and now has a message to deliver well when you go down to the churches that's not what they that that's not what you're going to get these guys are very popular you remember back in the old in the old times the prophets were always killed just about every one of them were murdered by the children of God. Some of them were murdered by other people, by pagans, but most of them were murdered by the Father's own people. And the reason why is because of that message that they were given. Usually it's a tough message that people don't want to, that people don't really want to hear. Uh, you know, and 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 so that's how that's one of the ways that you know that the prophets of today are lying is because all of their messages are good. Everything they have to say is good. Here we are in the, in the pre-tribulation times or the tribulation times, if you believe such. But yet nobody has a a a powerful, hard hitting message to deliver from the Father. No, it's because they're not. They're lying prophets. They're they're bringing you messages from that other Father, from that other. That other guy, if you know what I mean. And he says, these guys have an effect on the doubtful minded. Those people who haven't bothered to read the scripture, they, what does it say? Now those doubtful persons come to him as to a divine spirit and inquire of him what shall befall them. Meaning instead of going before the father and finding out what it is they're supposed to be doing or what it is they're supposed to be knowing, they run down to the reverend prophet, deacon Dr. Doug, and try to get information from them. All right, but let's go on. Verse five says, and this lion prophet, having no power in him of the divine spirit, answers them according to their demands and fills their souls with promises according as they desire. How be it that prophet is vain and answers vain things to those who are themselves vain. Yeah, so that's what's happening. You, you see after the church, after the church service, you see somebody go in and they start talking to the talking to the preacher there, asking him about certain things that's going to happen in their life. Am I going to get this new car? Am I going to get this house? Am I going to get this job? Am I going to get this wife? And the the prophet, what does he do? Does he get on his knees? Does he say, you know what, I got to go before the father and and and, and you know, spend uh, days, maybe weeks in prayer? You know, for him to give me some type of information that can help you. No, they just spit out some answer right then. Hey, of course you're going to get that new car. Of course you're going to get that, that new job. Of course you're going to get it, right? That's what they tell them. And, you know, they always tell them what they want to hear. They don't they don't come in and hurt their feelings. You know, no, you're going to end up getting a divorce. No, they don't tell them that. The person always leaves happy with what the information that they've gotten. And that's part of the prophet's job, because remember, he has to keep he has to keep them coming back every Sunday so that he can keep getting paid. If he told that person something that will make him reject them and leave the church, that's part of his income that's going to be walking out the door. And he, just like any storekeeper, 
is not going to let that happen. He's going to have to keep that money in his pocket. So he answers them according to their demands and fills their souls with promises according to their desire. He tells them exactly what they want to hear. But look why he's look what look how the Bible describes the situation is going here. It says, "How be it that prophet is vain, and he answers vain things." To those who themselves are vain. It's all about vanity. What's going on here? Verse 6 says, And whatsoever is asked of him by vain men, he answers them vainly. Nevertheless, he speaketh some things truly. For the devil fills him with his spirit, that he may overthrow some of the righteous. Yeah. So here you have this conversation. You have this vain individual who's going to the vain prophet to get vain information right that's what the that's what the scripture is saying here and then he, he, he it, but then look what happens the, the guy starts speaking some truth he start adding truth to the conversation true start and what does that mean he starts pulling out verses from the bible to back up what he's saying stuff like uh no weapon formed against me shall prosper or stuff like what other what some of the other feel good verses Stacey, you remember any of them verses about how you should get everything you want what are those favorite verses that you know people asking you ask and you shall receive uh, these are these are feel good verses that are actually in the bible they're actually true all things work for good for those who love the lord these things are actually true i'm the head and not the tail yeah you're going to be the head and not the tail but the thing is and so he's sprinkling these truths in here like pepper on the conversation and while he's telling them vain things he's sprinkling in a little bit of truth to make it sound like everything that he's saying is true you know and that's exactly what the devil does that's exactly what satan did to eve there in the garden he sprinkled just a little bit of truth in it to make what he was saying sound true but the overall big picture of what he was saying was a lie and it was detrimental to the person's health let's look what it says in verse seven he says Whosoever therefore are strong in the faith of the Lord and have put on the truth, they have not joined to such spirits, but depart from them. But they that are doubtful and often repenting, like the heathens, consult them and heap up to themselves great sin, serving idols. Yeah, that's what the scripture equates uh, talking to the false prophets too. Even our King James Version says the same thing. I think in Jeremiah somewhere like that. Maybe around chapter 14. It talks about how going down to the Reverend Prophet Deacon Dr. Doug. And trying to inquire about holy things. And what the, the Father's mind is. Is equivalent to idolatry. The Father expects you to go to the Word and find out what's going on. Not go to some man and find out what's going on. Um, it doesn't work like that. But that's the way it's working. He, uh, that's what's going on in our churches today. People are not consulting the scripture. They're going down and consulting their pastors and their deacons and those people down at the church. Trying to find out what's going on. And it's equivalent to idolatry. But you look here in this verse. He says those that are strong in the faith of the Lord are not affected by this dude. They don't want nothing to do with this dude. They, don't, they are not down there asking him any questions. That's why. The elect of God, if you do find them in a church, usually they're the first ones out of the church. They're in the car before everybody else even hit the door. They're in the car driving off. Why? Because there's, they know there's nothing to receive there. The, the, the preacher then gave his message. There's no other divination that's going to come out of him. You know, there's nothing else. There's, there's nothing else he can he can give them, so they don't go inquiring and trying to get any information out of them. But it is the doubtful that's going to hang around and want to be up there. You know. Shaking his hand and, and, and making making sure that he's got a good word for them for today. Say they'll say something like, "Hey, uh, hey, Rev, you remember my situation? It hasn't gotten any better. What do you think?" And then the Rev will say, "Of course it's going to get better. You got to just keep praying about it, and, and and of course it's going to get better. And it may not. The person may actually be in error. The person may be actually committing sins and doing stuff wrong." But that false prophet is not going to tell them that because he's afraid he's going to lose a customer. He's afraid he's going to lose when he's going to lose part of his income if he send that guy or that gal over to another church or another another false prophet to get their information. And that's exactly what will happen.
if if you go in to that false prophet and ask him something and he and he tries to tell you the truth or tries to tell you, you know, he don't know uh, how it's going to work out. You're going to go and find another pastor. You're going to go find another prophet or he wasn't a good prophet. He didn't have any good information for me. And so you're going to go find somebody else. And that other guy's going to be sure to tell you exactly what you want to hear so that you can come down and help fill up his collection plate. And that's what it's all about in these churches, guys. I hate to say it. You know, I'm a minister myself, but, you know, that's really what it is. It is a business. They are selling you stuff down there, you know, <clears throat> and the false prophet is selling you lies. He's selling he's telling he's selling you a false hope. Read, read Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14. If you want to get very specific, he's selling you lies and it's going to cost you and him his life. All right. Look at verse eight. And as many, therefore, as are such inquire of them upon every occasion. Worship in idols and are foolish and void of the truth. For every spirit that is given from God needs not be asked, but having the power of divinity speaks all things of itself, because he comes from above, from the power of God. And this is how you tell the real prophet. He doesn't have to be asked. Have you ever been in a church? Or in an environment where a guy was giving a, a, a talk about, you know, holy things or spiritual things. And it seemed like he was talking to you. It seems like he was talking directly to you. You may be in the back row with your, with your head half covered up or down in between the pew acting like you're reading your Bible. And it seems like the guy, you know, is reading your mind and calling out those things that you don't want to hear. It's like he's calling you out. That's, that's what it means to be a prophet. And you go up and you talk to the guy. I did it one time. I went up to the guy and said, well, you're talking to me and he's like oh I don't know what you're talking about I really didn't even know you was here how was you, how was I talking to you well this is what you will get if you ever around a real prophet he's not going to have to be asked nobody's going to have to ask him any day he's just going to tell you what the father has told him and it's going to come in a way that you and your spirit will understand says because he comes from above from the power of God and that's what a prophet I don't know if I told if I finished earlier what the uh, real prophet is told her what the what the fake prophet is the real prophet if you prophet a real prophet when you go in the in the scripture and read about prophets and and priests you have basically three men three types of ministers in the Old Testament Bible you have prophets priests and Levites Levi's were the majority of the guys. There was a bunch of Levi Levi's. These are the worker bees. These are the guys that was carrying the tent, taking down the tent. They was carrying the altar. They was putting up the tent. They was doing all the laborious work. These were the guys who would have been out slaughtering the animals and bringing them in and, and doing stuff. But then you have the priests. Now, the priests responsibility of the Old Testament was to go before the father on the behalf of man, meaning that if I when I have sinned or committed some type of transgression, it was the priest's responsibility to take my sin before the father to help me get an atonement for it. Now, the prophet, on the other hand, was opposite and in, in, in the sense that he came, his messages came not from man to the father, but from the father to man. He was talking down while the priest was talking up. The, the prophet was talking down. All right. Well, let's go on to verse 10. He says, but he that being asked speaks according to men's desires and concerning many other affairs of the present world. Understands not the tidings which relate unto God. For these spirits are darkened through such affairs and corrupted and broken. Meaning they have they have. They have cursed themselves. I, don't know, I say their words slowly. I guess I should have chosen one of these words you say here. They have corrupted themselves with this type of behavior. I mean, how how could you really expect the Father to be giving these people uh, truly divine and divinely inspired information to share with us on one day when on the next day they're going to be lying to us? Yesterday was lying. Tomorrow they're going to be lying, but today they're speaking the truth. No, they, it's not going to work like that. So he, they, they limit themselves. The father takes away that truth part from them altogether, and they don't get to speak truth anymore. It's like, okay, you want to be the father or the pastor of lies. Okay, well, we're going to let you be the pastor of lies. And what does Jeremiah 14, 14 say? Until the end where you find out the truth and you die in those lies.
right let's go on to 11 as good vines if they are neglected are oppressed with weeds and thorns and at last killed by them so are the men who believe in such spirits yeah so if you if 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 you're going to continue to go down to the false prophet to get information. You're going to be, like it says here, like good vines neglected. You're not going to ever be watered with the truth. You're never actually going to be pruned with the word or cultivated with those scriptures in there that tell you how you're supposed to be living your life. And weeds are going to th grow up and thorns are going to grow up and it's eventually going to kill you. You know, you got to get away from those type of spirits, those false spirits and get back into the true word of God or you're going to find yourself useless. Look at verse 12. They fall into many actions and business and are void of sense. And when they think of things pertaining unto God, they understand nothing at all. But at any time they chance to hear anything concerning the Lord, their thoughts are upon their business. Yeah, guys, this happened. I've tested this stuff. You know, I've tested everything in the Bible. But if you ever go in and start talking to an individual that fits the characteristics of what we're talking about in the previous verses, this is exactly what's going to happen. It's like they zone out on you. You're talking to them. They may be a preacher. They may be a pastor. Maybe anybody you would expect that carry on a conversation about the father. But as soon as you start talking about them, they start thinking about other stuff. Oh, I got to do laundry today. Oh, shoot. I got to go to work tomorrow. Or something like that you know what I'm saying they start talking about that lawnmower that's broke down it's like hey uh I thought we were just having a conversation about the, our father you know and you want to talk about your lawnmower uh yeah and it's what does it say here they understand nothing at all but at any time they chance to hear anything concerning the Lord their thoughts are upon their business right and the business what it's talking about when it's talking about this business um, just to give you a little bit of key here this goes back up here to these thorns right it says weeds and thorns down here it says uh, many actions and businesses businesses we know is a key for thorns um, I don't want to make the assumption too quick that actions and weeds go together but I definitely know that business and thorns when he talks about uh, thorns that's what he's talking about business affairs uh, thistles is talking about financial hardships and that kind of thing all right <clears throat> let's go on to verse 13 but they that have the fear of the Lord and search out the truth concerning God having all their thoughts toward the Lord apprehend whatsoever is said to them and forthwith understand it because they have the fear of the Lord in them. See, that's why the other guy zoned out because he had he had nothing. When you started talking to him, there was nothing in there for him to 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 have a proper response. And so all he could do was start zoning out, start talking about, you know, uh, his job and his four wheeler and other stuff that has nothing to do with the conversation that you guys are having is because there is nothing in him. And that's how you can find out the false prophet. I think in the next chapter, he goes in more detail on how to find out the false prophet. And you guys go ahead and subscribe to the channel because we're going to finish this series out and then we're going to finish out uh, similar to Ain't that right, Stay? Yeah, so we're going to finish out similar twos here. So you guys go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you can get those as we post them up. All right, let's go on to where we at. <clears throat> Verse 15. Learn now, O unwise man, how sadness troubleth the Holy Spirit and how it saves. When a man that is doubtful is engaged in any affair and does not accomplish it by reason of his doubting, this sadness enters into him and grieves the Holy Spirit and makes him sad all right so <clears throat> now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of how sadness works here in this verse we talk we find ourselves in in this in this uh situation a lot i think we already did the uh the um class or, or the command talking about doubtfulness but now he's talking about when a person is trying to accomplish something and how you know it's because of their doubtfulness that they are they don't accomplish that thing well then sadness creeps in then sadness takes over then sadness comes in and it's like woe is me why why am i not able to accomplish this thing now one of our classes we did over there uh uh stacy's been doing the classes on similitudes but we did we did do one class on similitudes and I did it myself and I put the title up as something like purified by pain or something like that where we talked about the um, two types of shepherds that you know are over man 
One of the things that we learn in that class is that we go through a period of punishment. There's a period of time when we have to talk to the angel of punishment. And during that period of punishment, nothing seems to work right for us. We learn in that class. We all go through this, especially those who are on a path trying to get closer or get back to the father. We find ourselves having to go through this punishment punishment period where nothing works for us. Well, it is during this during this time, you know, that sadness can creep in because when they say nothing works, I mean absolutely nothing works. Stuff that you know you are fully capable of doing ends up in error, ends up on the floor, ends up broken or messed up, and you really don't understand it. And and the only thing you can point to is that, you know what, this must this must be divinely inspired. There, there must be something going on here on a spiritual nature to why I can't fix this little bitty thing. I've fixed it 20 times before. Why is it that I can't fix it now? And then you start you start understanding that it has something to do with the Father, something to do with the Spirit, and something to do with you. And then that's when sadness kicks in. It's like, oh man, I believe I'm supposed to be able to do this. And what does it say? This sadness enters into him and grieves the Holy Spirit and makes him sad. So you've gotten sad. But now you've gone into the Holy Spirit, the spirit that dwells inside of you, and you've make it it sad too. Remember, you are three parts. Just like the Father is the just like the Creator has three parts. He's He's the Father, He's the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit. You are three parts too. You are mind, body, and soul. You are which is uh, conscious, you are the body, and you are the spirit. You have a spirit man living inside of you. Well, when you start to become sad, that, that spirit man inside of you becomes sad just along with you. He is you. That that the spirit inside of you is you, you know, and it becomes sad. And you really don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, um, it, it communicates with the Father directly. That spirit inside of you communicates with the Father directly. And we're going to find out here in a few minutes that he can't communicate with the spirit if you are if you are sad or if you are grieved. All right. Let's go on to 16. Again, anger, when it overtakes any man for any business, he is greatly moved. And then again, sadness entereth into the heart of him who was moved with anger. And he is troubled for what he has done and repenteth because he has done amiss. All right. Now, you switch gears just a little bit here. In 15, you was talking about how sadness was bad and how it grieved the Holy Spirit and basically messes things up for you. But look here in 16 is how he's talking about sadness is a good thing. Not I, I shouldn't say it like that. It not, may not be a good thing. But in this case here, sadness actually helps you. It's talking about when we go off and in anger, we do something that we're not supposed to do. It is afterwards that we realize that we have done a miss and we start to feel a little bit of sad. And that's what brings on our repentant heart when we start to feel sad for those things that we've done. And that's what he means by how can it save? Remember Herman said, wait, how can it how can it harm you and then help you later on? Well, this is the case where sadness can actually help you when it can help you help you get back into a repentant heart, help you feel sorry for, for what you have done. But let's look at 17. This sadness, therefore, seems to bring salvation because he repents of his evil deeds. But both the other things, namely doubting and sadness, such as before were mentioned, vex the spirit. Doubting because his works did not succeed and sadness because he angered the Holy Spirit. So these things are harming people. Talking about sadness, talking about anger, talking about doubting. Guys, it's really important that we keep these things away. Now, I think, like I said, in the last chapter, we talked about doubting. But sadness is even worse than doubting. In one of the other chapters, we talked about anger and how anger is 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 uh, bad for us, and how you can imagine being angry, you know, does us some harm. But we were learned in the early part of this chapter that that uh, sadness is the worst of all. Sadness affects us the most. Uh, you don't want to anger the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is a touchy thing. Remember, blaspheming the Holy Spirit will cost you everything, right? That's the only sin that will never be forgiven, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So that should let you know that it's serious business when you have an effect on the Holy Spirit. And here, sadness and anger and doubting all have an effect on the Holy Spirit. So we have to be really careful. But let's look at verse 18. Remove therefore sadness from thyself, and afflict not the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in thee, lest he entreat God and depart from thee. 
For the spirit of the Lord which is given to dwell in the flesh endureth no such sadness. How about this guys? You can actually make the spirit of God leave you. What does it say right there? He will entreat the father in order to get away from you. He will go and say hey I can't live with this dude. I can't live with this guy. I need to be gone. And then you will find yourself void of the Holy Spirit. The same thing happens when we start raising and fussing and arguing. The Holy Spirit will leave you. He will go dwell with those who are meek and humble leaving you to completely tear yourself up leaving you with no help from the inside to get back on track and so we find out you know sadness can push him away too and that's something we don't want to do we always want the spirit with us helping us and so we have to be sure not to grieve this this spirit through our sadness all right let's look at 19 wherefore clothe thyself with cheerfulness which has always favor with the Lord, and thou shalt rejoice in it. For every cheerful man does well, and relishes those things that are good, and despises sadness. Yeah, so we have to be cheerful. We have to be happy. You know, we've always met these guys before who, you know, I know I have. We see them and they, they come across as being some type of man of, man of God or some type of, you know, person in the word. And they seem to be the happiest person on the world. It's like, is this guy for real? Is he serious? Can he really be this happy and joyful all the time? And yeah, at some point he learned this virtue of cheerfulness. He learned to put on cheerfulness. And no matter what comes, he tries to keep himself cheerful in it. And it may be hard to do. I can imagine it's hard to do. That's one of the things that I'm working on is trying to be cheerful through all of the trials and stuff that we go through. Um, it's one of the things that I need help with. And I look at this guy and I say, well, you know, how is he able to do that? But in other parts of the book and other parts of the Shepherd of Hermas, we find that if we actually try, if we put forth the effort to do so, then the angel of repentance will help us to make, to be cheerful. I guess he'll take some of the hurtful things away and help us to be cheerful. But it is important that we are cheerful. Look right here. For every cheerful man does well, right? So you want to want to do well in life is to be cheerful. That's what it's saying here. We believe the words for what they say. We believe the scripture for what it says. And he says every cheerful man does well. We want to do well. Well, we have to be cheerful. We have to put sadness away and be cheerful. All right, let's go on to 20. Stacy, you can jump in anytime you want to. But look at 20. He says, but the sad man does always wickedly. First, he does wickedly because he grieveth the Holy Spirit, which is given to man being of a cheerful nature. And again, he does ill because he prays with sadness unto the Lord and maketh not a first thankful acknowledgement unto him of former mercies and obtains not of God what he asks. This is sadness getting in the way of our prayers, right? When, and you could imagine, you know, you think about it for a minute. When you are sad and you go before the Father to to with your prayers, your prayers aren't right. Your prayer, you, you remember in the Lord's Prayer there on the Sermon of the Mount, the Father gave us very specific rules on how to how to pray. Well, when, when we are having sadness in our heart, we aren't showing the proper reverence. We aren't showing the um, proper gratitude. We aren't doing our prayers correctly. And so our prayers ends up missing the mark. Right. And this is what sadness does. This is another way sadness affects us is it makes us so our prayers aren't heard or our prayers aren't answered. I think one of the things about sadness is that it uh, it takes thankfulness away from you. You're not thankful. Uh, you go automatically into uh, woe is me and you don't think about the things that the Father has done. But you start thinking about, I don't understand. Why would you let this happen? It just doesn't make no sense. You become sad and it's like a conglo conglomerate of uh, the doubtfulness. Uh, the anger, uh, the ill feeling you're having um, uh, just about your si situation, and you just become um, ungrateful. And so your prayers aren't answered. Your prayers aren't heard. All right. Thank you for that, Stacy. All right. Well, let's go on to verse 21. He says, for the prayer of a sad man has not always efficacy to come up to the altar of God. And I said unto him, sir. Why has not the prayer of a sad man virtue to come up to the altar of God? Because, said he, that sadness remaineth in thy heart. 
right? And it's like it's like Stacy said, you don't have the proper gratitude in order to get your prayers heard. You, you, you remember the Father is answering our prayers all the time, and if you don't remember that, how are you going to go and expect this new thing to to uh, to be answered or fulfilled when you don't really remember the old things. You don't remember what he did for you yesterday. And that's what sadness does. It, it takes all of that stuff out of your mind. You're not remembering. It's like Stacy said, you don't remember those good things. And so here it is. Your your, your prayer is coming up afflicted and it's not going to be answered. All right. So look at verse 22. When therefore a man's prayers shall be accompanied with sadness, it will not suffer his request to ascend pure to the altar of God. For as wine, when it is mingled with vinegar, has not the sweetness it had before, so sadness, being mixed with the Holy Spirit, suffers not a man's prayers to be the same as it would be otherwise. Sadness is tainting our prayers. It's, it's like vinegar and wine. You, you you really don't want to drink it. It's, you, know, we, you know, we would want to present the Father with the best wine that we can offer but we have instead added vinegar and now we're holding up holding it up to him saying drink it you know and you know will he you know we don't we don't know we know our prayers are heard but you know not all of our prayers are answered and when we have this bitter wine that we're offering up that may be reason for our prayers not to be answered all right Let's go on here. It looks like the last verse here. Verse 23. It says, Wherefore, cleanse thyself from sadness, which is evil, and thou shalt live unto God. And all others shall live unto God, as many as shall lay aside sadness and put on cheerfulness. All right? So we got to put away our sadness. We got to put on cheerfulness. All right? Stacey, you got anything else before we wrap this up? I would just like to say that uh, sadness uh, just hearing it say that sadness is evil, it made me think about how sometimes when I've been sad before, and um, I I've often tried to use my sadness to uh, manipulate the father by going to him and saying, you know, father, you know, this just doesn't make sense to me. Why would you let this happen to your child and and, and things of that nature? So. Uh, sadness can be evil. It can lead you into um, grieving the Holy Spirit. It makes me think about, you know, uh, when you, when the Father, when someone gives you a gift and um, you take that gift and you, you know, tat say they give you a piece of clothing, you tatter that clothing, you, you know, you, you, you don't take good care of it. Well, that's what grieving the Holy Spirit is. The Father has given us a gift and we grieve the Holy Spirit by becoming sad. And, you know, it would be belittling to that person that have given you that gift to offer that tattered piece of clothing back to you. Well, that's what the Father is saying to us when we give the, grieve the Holy Spirit. He wants the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come back to him. And he doesn't want it tattered. He doesn't want it full of sadness. He wants it to, to have a cheerful countenance. All right. Thank you very much. All right, guys. With that, we're going to go ahead and close it out. Um, we have the uh, next class that's coming up. It's going to be Command 11. That the spirits and prophets are to be tried by their works and of a twofold spirit. Talking about how to find out the false prophet from the real prophet. All right, guys, we're going to close it out there. Put down the sadness and pick up cheerfulness. Hermes Academy. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtues.